for people from uh, my generation, sometimes it can be a little bit surprising how little sometimes uh, you, uh, students understand freedom of speech. But I always try to sort of take a big, an even bigger step back and explain that freedom of speech is a very weird thing historically. Um, everybody's natural instincts are, um, whether we like to admit it or not, are to that, you know, I, I agree with free speech and everything, but that person should be shut down. And most of human history are people being shut down for, for, for their opinions. Um, uh, free speech is actually comparatively rare. So I'm never surprised when students think that, for example, you know, hate speech should be banned. And, um, and I'm also equally not surprised that they have a hard time defining precisely what they're talking about. Because I think we don't do a very good job of teaching uh, people uh, and students, uh, particularly today, how a lot of the you know, uh, you know good and decent beliefs that they take for granted were at one time considered highly controversial. Everything from gay rights to civil rights um, to uh, women's rights were things that were considered you know indecent and, and not uh, not worth mentioning by, by previous generations. Um, I think that in some ways freedom of speech is a victim of its own success, um, that essentially we were able, uh, people my age and older, were able to take it so much for granted um, that we didn't do a very good job of explaining it to, to younger people. And I think that, that, but it's also that we forget that there's something fundamentally unintuitive about it, that really freedom of speech is about the fact that individually we're not all that clever and that we need to keep an open mind, we need to uh, learn from talking to, talking to one another, and that includes both uh, in space and in real time, but also throughout history, to, to look at past texts and to find out what people thought centuries ago. And what can, one of the things that does concern me about what students um, sometimes seem to want is if someone wrote a, an article from many years ago and, and doesn't say it by, by, by the currently approved language, um, that they don't even want to, they don't even want to be exposed to it, and that's cutting themselves off from so, so very much history. Um, and I think that if you, you know, approach life and education with epistemic humility, which is just a fancy way of saying being aware that in the grand scheme of things you don't know all that much, you're able to learn so much more. But there's just so hard we can be on students about not understanding freedom of speech when nobody's taught it to them. A really common misconception that I run into a lot is that um, students and a lot, of, a lot of people in general think that hate speech is a category of unprotected speech under the First Amendment. This is completely wrong. Um, the case law is incredibly clear that even horrible bigots have free speech rights too. Now that's the law though um, and what, one of my jobs is to convince people why that's actually a good idea. And this is the way I put it pretty, pretty simply. Um, there's always a value in knowing what people really think and not even if it's horrible, but especially when you think it's horrible. I think we've just gone, you know, in 2016, I think we went through an election where there was a big segment of the population who was saying, you know, actually I'd prefer not to know what you really think on this. And a lot of that, a lot of the response was a, was a big revolt against that. And it even came out in the polling that, that essentially the fact that people realized they'd be judged for saying that they wanted to vote for Trump meant that, that we were under polling on that and means we're all surprised by what happens in 2016. Um, and the way I like to really stress it is, you're not safer for knowing less about the world in which you live. If there are bigots out there who have uh, conspiracy theories, it's probably good that you know who those people are, you know what they believe and why. And this may sound kind of surprising sometimes, but for example, um, you know, uh, uh, Jonathan Rauch is one of my heroes. Um, he, uh, it, you know, champion of the gay rights movement, gay man himself, um, you know, way ahead of the curve on gay marriage. And he would take very seriously the fact that there was, you know, popular myths that um, uh, gay men were molesting children, or more likely to. When actually it came out that that when you started doing the research, that wasn't actually true. But you have to know what the myths are about people before you can actually uh, you can actually break them. So uh, campuses, you know, absolutely as any president, university president will tell you, are special communities. Um, and uh, there's a, a very reasonable idea that university presidents may not be able to censor, um, or they shouldn't censor, particularly at a, and they can't at a school bound by the First Amendment. Um, but they can meet speech with more speech. And I, I, I support that in general, but I do, I am usually the person pointing out the downside there though is that presidents have to be responsible and careful to everything they respond to. Because what the situation you can end up having 
um, is that someone is basically the president coming down and saying, "Oh, well, this person was," and we've seen this actually happen. Someone was wearing a "Make America Great Again" hat, and like that's not the kind of inclusive environment we want to have. And it's like, but you are telling people if they are Trump-supporting Republicans that they're not really welcome there. Um, so while certainly a president has a lot of power to use his bully pulpit, what you want to avoid and what a university really wants to avoid is creating a sense of orthodoxy, that essentially there's a way to think like this person at the school. Because part of the crazy commitment of higher education is that you, you are trying to create an environment that is radically open-minded. It's open-minded to its most sacred uh, assumptions. And that's a hard thing to do when a, a university president feels obliged to actually comment on every single thing and, and show what side of the issue they're on.